arrived on Patmos in 1987 with plenty of reservations about the place. Frankly, I'd done a lot of traveling, so foreign parts had no charms for me just because they were foreign, especially the ones where the tourists flock in the summer. Felicity was by this time an orthodox believer, and she had taken me to an orthodox place. But if I was under any pressure, I didn't know it. I put him here. I planted him in Patmos. <laughs> And I hope people wouldn't push him too hard, because it would only do damage. And <laughs> knew that if he enjoyed his food and his drink and the language, he'd get there. I've heard it said that a place is on earth which sensitive people feel are special. They say the veil between heaven and earth has worn thin and you can feel promptings from the other side. Some say this about Patmos and most of them are not Christians. I notice straight away the island is steeped in Christianity. But instead of being focused in the grey church or chapel that a few sombre people file into every Sunday morning, here Christianity is full of life and colour and is everywhere. This is a hermitage. This is a holy place. Today is a holy day. In fact, today is All Saints Day. The first thing that struck me about Patmos was um, the Greeks were clearly people who knew how to enjoy themselves. Uh, this is something that hadn't occurred to me because the only contact I'd had with Greeks was through books, and Greeks who wrote books tended to be the intellectuals who tended on the whole not to know how to enjoy themselves. Um, so I found this culture of people who had an immense zest for life, an immense capacity to enjoy themselves. And so this obviously attracted me very much because uh, a capacity to enjoy oneself is something which I've always thought to be a supreme human virtue. I've always been very keen on it. Um, so that was the first thing, but then I got pitched into Greek, and I suppose that really was important, wasn't it? That, that mm. um, I had no Greek, I hadn't had Greek at school, I had Latin. Um, I knew it was supposed to be um, a very difficult language, but a, a very um, scholarly language, so I thought, well, I'll have a crack at Greek and see if, see if I can get anywhere with it. And once I started... I very, very quickly was completely absorbed. En archi in o logos, que o logos in prostum theon, que theos in o logos. One of the most exciting things for me on Patmos was hearing the words of the Gospels read in the language in which they were written. And those wonderful words from the beginning of the Gospel of St. John have a particular resonance because of this word logos. That's the sound that St. John had in his mind when he wrote down that word. That sound, logos, is a sound that perhaps Jesus and the apostles heard. And when I hear it here today, it makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Felicia had very sensibly told me to leave my books behind, which I did. But it didn't take long to discover the library of the monastery of St. John Theologian, one of the most famous in the Orthodox world. And I came here a lot. Then a very exciting thing happened. I had read the Gospel of John hundreds of times, because I loved it in English and, 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 and in Latin. And it's very beautiful in Latin. When I read it in Greek, I suddenly discovered some amazing things. The Gospel of John has always been historically put down as the great mystical gospel. It was written long after all these things happened. It's not a historical work at all. It's a great work of of mystery and theology. Well, when you read the thing in Greek, you look at it and you say, when Christ goes to visit Lazarus, the house, when, when he's ill, and we've got this great story coming out, this wonderful story. Now, if you're writing a wonderful story about somebody who's about to raise someone from the dead, you don't say, and Christ was coming and Martha saw that he was coming, so Martha left the house and she ran out to meet him and talked to him. Then she went back and Mary, by the way, she hadn't left the house, she stayed in the house, and then she went out to meet him. 
Ah, you, <laughs> you don't write that if you're writing a mystical text, if you're writing a, something which is there simply to persuade people into faith. Of course you don't, you write it, because that's the way it happened. That, you know, I can remember that. And these details, of course, I should have known in English, but somehow it was just by reading the Greek words that I suddenly thought the man who wrote those words, he was remembering something that had happened. Doesn't mean it was true. I would still have said he might have got it wrong, but he was remembering what was happening. He was not constructing a, a, a literary document to persuade anybody of anything at all. As I wandered through and soaked up the atmosphere of the monasteries and churches on Patmos, I never felt at all disapproved of. Here I was, the unbelieving husband of an orthodox wife, to be seen from time to time in church, enjoying its beauty but never yielding to its message. I must have been seen as ripe for conversion, a prime target for the proselytizers, but if they had me in their sights, they didn't come out in the open and challenge me. If people were proselytizing, I wouldn't have reacted against it. I would have loved it. Nothing I like more than sitting down with a good song. argument. I have a good argument, yeah. And they used to wheel out the odd Serbian theologian or something down at um, yeah. Evangelism Moss, didn't they? Mm. Never had anybody who could speak, because I Greek was very bad, but if they had someone who could speak French or English, um, and he was, particularly, they knew that I was very keen on brainy people, so if there's anybody who was a doctor at something or other, or a professor even better, they'd bring me up and get me to go down there and talk to him. And of course, there's nothing I love better than talking to doctors and theologians and so on about the real truth of the Christian faith and does God exist. You slipped straight into your everyman mode. In those circumstances it was hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> From the very first moment that we met the nuns in this community, they seemed to focus in on me. They introduced me to learned Serbian theologians, candid orange peel. They gave me improving tracts and books on orthodoxy. But most alarming of all, from my point of view, they apparently spent hours on their knees praying for my soul. <laughs> Here at Evangelismos, all those years of loving kindness kept nagging away at the back of my mind. Where had I else come across this uncritical affection, this wish for my well-being, this concentration on me for apparently no particular reason? And then I suddenly realized my old Sunday school teacher back in Yorkshire, Ada Hopper. Ada had been my first childhood experience of Christian faith in action. Now, once again, I was coming up against people who seemed to want to do me good without resenting the fact that I didn't believe what they did. I suppose, you know, it has, it, it has to happen to people. Um, eventually, you come through your life and you look back at the people who have really impressed you and you find your amazement that the ones who, who really made a, a deep impression have a religious dimension. In my case, most of them were Christians. The most moving impression I had happened one day in direct confrontation with an Orthodox priest his name was Father Amphilochios. We were sitting here in a small group one morning. It was about half past seven, a nice, fresh, cool morning like this, and we just had a service in the church behind me, the Church of the Holy Trinity. Father Amphilochios was here. The priest I'd been introduced to was the man who was going to show me the way to Christianity. And I had an interpreter, so I decided to put forward my best everyman front and find out about him. And I said to him, I understand you've been a missionary for many years in Africa and you've converted many tribes in Africa to Christianity. Now, let me tell you about my tribe, because we have a rather special problem. You see, we've been Christian for about 1,500 years, and now we know all about Christianity and we've seen through it. 
We know that Christianity, like all religion, is simply a matter of people being emotionally insecure and wanting some sort of answer to the problems they have in their lives. We've read the Bible for the whole of this time and we know it backwards. So we've rejected Christianity, not out of ignorance, but out of knowledge. Now what are you going to say to us to make us believe what you believe in? And he looked at me and his answer was, I wouldn't say anything to you. I would be with you and I would love you. Now, if I'd heard those words at any time during my heyday as an everyman reporter, I'd have known immediately how to react. Here was a man who was simple, sincere, not terribly bright, and therefore I would be kind to him, conclude the interview quickly, and uh, wrap up. However, hearing them here, in this place at that time from that man, they touched me more deeply than any words I'd ever heard. And the reason was, I was ready for them. Father Amphilokios simply lives out Christ's words. He owns nothing, he gives everything to the poor, and he loves people, not out of a sense of duty, because the Bible tells him to, but spontaneously, with a great warmth that shines out of him. Now, I've met quite a lot of religious, religiously possessed people, I think I can say, in, in the everyman days. From all faiths, I've met people who've had a glassy stare in their eyes. Um, I've met happy clappers for Jesus. I've met um, gurus. I've met people who've been zapped by gurus. This is not what I'm talking about. The luminescence in this man's face was something interior, something constant. He's a living, he is a living face. It sounds so trite, but he has, he has what it takes, what it, what it can give you, and it, you can see it in a person, this man. I used to come to this side chapel at the monastery to be alone and think. No, n not to think, just to be still and perhaps experience. I'd come to realize that my scientific and philosophical rationalism had been dissolved away by the warmth of love and human goodness, that the hold I had on reality, given me by my intellect, had loosened, and that there was, as yet, nothing to take its place. I was... Uh, I felt I would love to have been a Christian, I suppose, but I had this one little problem. I didn't believe in God. <laughs> 